This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, right. It's a great honor to be here today, and uh, thank you for joining me. And um, I hope you will enjoy my my talk. And uh, so today we talk about suppression of the host immune system and how instead and microbe infectors take control. Now, I would like to give you a brief introduction about the plant immune system. And uh, you can see here different uh, pathogens, and they're trying to attack the plant cells and uh, possibly to gather nutrients. On the other part, we have uh, plant cells that during the co-evolution uh, develop strategy to first recognize these pathogens and then to, to effectively give a, a defense responses. And uh, these rely on the plant immune system. And we can uh, divide this plant immune system into major layers. One is called a PTI, pump trigger immunity. And it relies on um, a surface receptor kinase called PRR, pattern recognition receptor. This receptor can perceive conserved molecule from uh, pathogens. These are called PAMPs, pathogen associated molecular patterns. Now, when this receptor like FLS2 recognize flagellin, will uh, first associate with a co-receptor, for example, BAC1, uh, which is, uh, um, is required for the signaling. And uh, this will follow um, calcium elevation, followed by uh, ROS production. ROS are reactive oxygen species like hydrogen peroxide. And uh, the hydrogen peroxide will oxidize all the membrane and cause cell death. So the pathogen cannot spread. And uh, for many of the pathogens, this is the end of their journey. But also bacteria co-evolve with the plant and um, they develop different strategies like uh, uh, effector molecules. These molecules are um, translocated directly inside the cell and they can um, manipulate, interfere with the PTI. So we don't have any more uh, the ROS production. And here we have the second layer of a plant immune system called ETI. And we have another class of receptor, uh, also known as um, resistant proteins. They can specifically recognize the factor molecule and trigger the ETI, effector, effector trigger immunity, which is a faster, stronger response. Now, you can see these are different kinds of pathogens. And um, you have a bacterium, nematodes, <laughs> Fungus. And it's also nice to see that we have this effort system fitting these uh, models. And uh, this is a new entry. This is a recent uh, uh, concept of effort secreting a factor uh, to, modulate, to modulate the plant host. So, what are these effectors? So, effectors are molecules produced by pathogens that modify host molecular behavior to enable parasitism. And uh, we have different kinds of effectors, for example, apoplastic effectors. These are secreted to the host extracellular space and they can target host proteases. We have also cytoplasmic effectors and uh, these effectors are translocated inside the cell and can suppress or otherwise manipulate host proteases. Now, characterization of molecular function or effectors provide key information for understanding processes underlying plant colonization by pathogens. And this is what I'm doing with my research. I'm trying to functionally characterize a factor from different pathosystems. Now, let's go back. And uh, this is my little bit of my background. So I attend my bachelor and master's degree in plant biology in Turin and uh, in Italy. And after that, I did my study in, uh, in England, in Norwich. And here I tried to expand my research topic and uh, I was studying plant insect interaction. And uh, more recently, I moved here in US at USDA RS. And uh, my study was, we're focusing on uh, plant insect microbial interaction. And now at UF, I'm uh, also trying to develop tools in order to solve agricultural problems. And um, I'm also interested in uh, interaction between fungus and uh, insect. So after my study in Turin, I uh, 
went to Norwich. And uh, here they have a really nice research park. And uh, for example, this is a genomic analysis center. We have the Sainsbury Laboratory and the John Linnes Center. And uh, I was able to establish a collaboration between uh, University of Turin and uh, the John Linnes Center. And uh, here, we, I was, um, we were trying to functionally characterize a factor protein from uh, to aphid mysis persice and uh, epizum. And uh, here is an EM picture from uh, epizum. And you can see this is a peculiar uh, mouth part. Now, for a plant pathogen to be successful, manipulation of host cell processes to promote virulence is essential, which is achieved by the secretion of molecule term effectors. And uh, to do that, we use this uh, novel approach based on a combination of bioinformatics and functional assay, assay to identify effectors for mysis persice. And these are uh, how we identify these effectors. So we start with the uh, ESTs. Uh, salivary gland from mysis persice. Then we look for a protein containing a signal peptide. Signal peptide tells to the cell to translocate outside the protein. And then we remove all the protein with the transmembrane domain. So we want a protein that can move. Uh, and uh, we finish to uh, identify 46 candidate effectors. So this is one of the functional analysis we did to characterize these effectors. And so we uh, overexpressed this candidate in Nicotiana mentamiana, and then we cut leaf disc and use this acrylic plate, and then we add four nymphs each leaf disc. And then we count the number of nymphs produced. And uh, one effector, MPCO2, increased the number of the nymphs when they were feeding on this plant. So you may in indicate that this protein is important on the plant inks and interaction. But we also have two MP10 and MP42 that actually decrease the numbers of nymphs produced. And uh, we also found that MP10 is actually inducing chlorosine and a weak cell death. But also it can uh, suppress PTI induced by palm flagellin. And uh, this is a quite a contradiction of observation, right? So the hypothesis is that Overexpression of MP10 is actually triggering some plant defense responses. And uh, perhaps in a normal aphid plant interaction, other effectors are suppressing this response, and MP10 can uh, contribute to the virulence by suppressing the PTI. Now, there is another way to functionally characterize uh, gene function, and um, is using uh, RNA silencing. So we can knock down the gene expression of Aphid genes. So how this RNA interference works. So if we know the sequence of our RNA messenger, we can uh, synthesize double cell RNA and then uh, deliver to the cells, which will recognize this double cell RNA using dicer enzyme. We will chop the double cell RNA in small interference RNA. And then we'll complex with risk, which will uh, uh, identify the corresponding uh, messenger RNA and block the transcription. Now, at that time, there were two systems for uh, uh, double cell RNA delivery. It was um, the injection or artificial diet. But both systems have some drawbacks. For example, you need an injector. You need to make glass needles. You need to produce double cell RNA. And uh, also for the artificial diet, you need to optimize the diet for the aphids. You need to replace the diet because of contamination and both are, are in artificial condition. So I decided to use a different system. And uh, I use this vector that allows the expression of double RNA in plants. So I generate transgenic Arabidopsis expressing double RNA to target aphid genes. And I also use a transient expression using Nicotiana, uh, Nicotiana mentamiana. And uh, I want to show you the results using uh, the transient expression. So we select two genes. One, MPCO from salivary gland. This is the gene that increases the NIMS when the aphid feed on, on overexpression uh, plant. And uh, a GAT protein. 
we want to see if the signal was able to move from the gut and uh, to the salivary gland. And this is the results using the leaf disc I showed you before. And this after 17 days of effort feeding on this plant expressing double serine RNA. You can see we can suppress the gene expression of both genes. And these are almost 50%, which is similar to the amount of silencing you can get with, double, with the injection and with the feeding on artificial diet. These are effort feeding on the double serine RNA. And, uh, this is the fecundity results. We found that silencing MPCO2 reduced the number on produced. So if you overexpress this gene, increase the number of the NIMS. If you silence this gene, you decrease the number of the NIMS produced. And uh, this uh, rack is the gut protein. So we think that it may be important for uptaking nutrients. So by silencing then, we have a less nutrient uptake and that um, will uh, decrease the fecundity. So these are northern blood uh, using the leaf tissue. And uh, we are expressing double cellular array in plants, but we can detect small interference RNA. So this is the, the our leaf tissue from um, plant expressing double cellular array for MPCO2 and this for RAC. So as I told you before, the plant recognized double cellular array and chop in small interference RNA. So the effort is actually uptaking small interference RNA. And this was a quite um, system that I developed to have an easy way to deliver double cell RNA. And uh, I didn't um, expect that then later, this system was actually used not only in aphid, on, but in other insect uh, species. But also, it can be used as a tool for insect management. Now, we were also interested in see if these effi defectors have adapted to modulate processes in a specific plant species. So we have a generalist effort like Mises perception, and we have a specialist effort like epizone. You can fit only on legume. So we generate transgenic plant expressing Mises perception defectors and uh, transgenic plant expressing epizone orthologs. And then we did the fecundity assay on, uh, on Arabidopsis. And uh, so this is how we work. So we add the adults on the plant, then we wait for the new nymphs so we can synchronize the, uh, the age of the nymphs. And then we cage them again. And then we wait for 16 days and we count the number of the nymphs produced. And uh, these are is the results. So my dispersage, a factor promote fecundity in my dispersage, only when they are feeding on a plant expressing my dispersage effectors, not when they are feeding on epizone or tolops. And uh, we reveal that there is a high non-synonymous versus synonymous nucleotide substitution rates with effector tolops. So indicating that effectors in my dispersage are fast evolving as a consequence of evolutionary pressure which drives rapid diversification on effector function to improve um, function when they, they are secreted in the cell or for uh, escaping um, the recognition by plant immune system. And uh, this is the last work we did with EFITS. And uh, at the beginning, I show you that one of the earliest physiological response to pump is a calcium elevation. And we found that aphid feeding site uh, triggered this calcium elevation. These are transgenic plant expressing a biomarker that binds calcium. And this is the site of the, feed, or the feeding site of aphid. Now, we didn't see calcium elevation when we use a transgenic plant expressing this biomarker in the phloem. So only when the aphid was uh, probing in the mesophyll. And uh, we found that this calcium elevation is a back one dependent. Back one is the core receptor required for signaling. This is a, is a back one mutant. We don't have any more the calcium elevation. And uh, also there is a vacuole ion channel, TPC1, that contribute to the, to the calcium elevation. And uh, this is a mutant for the TPC1 and we have a lower uh, calcium concentration. But if we use a TPC1 overreaction, we have a burst of calcium that can actually, we use a fecundity assay on this plant and uh, reduce 
the EFID uh, performance. So EFID trigger calcium elevation during probing of epiderma and mesophyll cell. And uh, saliva, which contain effectors, are sec is secreted into the cell types, different cell types, and it can uh, actually uh, suppress the feeding site of calcium elevation. And uh, most cells along the stylet pathway are punctured intracellularly. And uh, we know that the cells are punctured by using the electric electrical penetration graph. And uh, you can see here there is a effit wired, and now this is a part of the circuit. So when the effit start probing with the stylet, we generate a signal which is converted in a waveforms. And uh, this waveform corresponding corresponds to a particular uh, feeding behavior. For example, PD is a potential drop when then the stylet function the cell. E1 and E2 is, a, uh, is when the, the stylet reach the phloem and uh, start feeding. So you can see the effit puncture many uh, epiderma and mesophyll cell. So this is the model now. Effit similar to plant pathogens, inject protein into host plants to manipulate host cell process, enabling successful manifestation of plant. And here is a cell with the stylet and the saliva contain effectors. It can modulate the PTI response. Okay, I don't know. So concluding remarks. So in our work provides important evidence that herbivores insect, similar to plant pathogenic microbes, secrete effector inside host cells, they interact with host protein and modify their activity to facilitate infestation. So this was my work uh, during my PhD. And uh, after that, I moved to here in the US, in Florida, and um, First with the USDA, ARS, and now at UF, I'm trying to conduct research to develop and transfer solution to solve agricultural, agriculture problem. And uh, so how do we transfer basic principle to disease management programs? How can we control vector using sustainable system? How can we reduce the economic impact caused by plant disease? How do we minimize the input and maximize the output? And so I want to show you a screening I developed uh, to identify uh, citrus less susceptible to canker disease. This is a canker disease and is, a, is a caused by this bacteria, Santomonas citrus, and these are the symptoms on leaves and uh, on fruit. Now, we know that in, during the PTI, plant cells using the PRR receptor like the FLS2 can recognize flagellin and start the PTI. But we can also use a, a peptide called FLS flagellin 22. So we don't need to use uh, the living bacteria. We use a, a peptide. And this will uh, trigger the same PTI response with the ROS production. So because of that, I designed this screening and uh, I show you how it works. So I, we, can, we take leaf disc from uh, citrus plants and then we use these 96 plates, we put the leaf disc on these 96 plates plus the flagellin. These are the list of the trigger hydrogen peroxide. And we can convert this hydrogen peroxide in a signal. And this is the end result. And you can see it's a really quick, it's quick um, a response. After a few minutes, we can measure the hydrogen peroxide. And uh, then we have a peak and then it goes to the basic level. But what's interesting is that we have different level of ROS uh, production. And I found that citrus more susceptible to citrus canker produce low amount of ROS, while plant less susceptible to citrus canker produce high concentration of ROS. And so I screen uh, hundreds of um, citrus. This is a, is a, 
Cataranthus roseus is a um, sour orange. And then I separate plant with high rose production and plant with a low rose production. And then I infect this plant with living bacteria. And the high rose production corresponded to lower uh, canker lesion. And uh, with low rose production correspond to high uh, canker lesion. So with this system, live pathogen is substituted with the flagellin peptide, particularly when the pathogen is regulated. And this is a rapid method for identifying citrus seedling less susceptible to Santomonas citrus. And uh, you don't need to propagate plants for pathogenicity tests. And uh, now this uh, system is uh, implemented in citrus hybrid selection, uh, USDA for peers. Now, this system allows you to identify plants that are less susceptible. But we have some citrus that are uh, normally um, very susceptible, so they don't, uh, they don't produce high ROS. So how can we uh, improve the tolerance, the resistance of these plants? So in this case, we use the transgenics tools. So we took the FLS2 PRR receptor from Nicotiana bentamiana, and we generate transgenic sweet orange. Sweet orange usually produce low ROS using the flagellin 22. And uh, these are the results. So transgenic plant expressing Nicotiana bentamiana FLS2 as a high ROS compared to the contour, and these again, after infection with living bacteria cause less uh, lesion on the leaves. So overexpression of Nicotiana FLS2 in transgenic citrus increased canker resistance. Now, I will switch to another citrus disease, and this is called citrus anglone bean, HLB, or citrus greening disease. This is one of the most destructive diseases of citrus worldwide and is already jeopardizing all the Flor uh, Florida citrus industry. And um, the problem is spread really quickly. And uh, if you have these nice grows in Florida without proper management, in less than five years, you can add, end up like this. You can grow skeletons. And uh, right now in Florida, we have more than 130,000 acres of groves abandoned. So this uh, disease is caused by Candidatus liberobacter asiaticus and is uh, spread by Diaphorina citri, which can feed all citrus varieties. These are typical symptoms of HRB. You have uh, an even distribution of yellow. And uh, to give you some numbers, again, I don't know if the zoom is interfering. Okay. So Silas was initially detected in uh, Florida in 2005. And since then, the production of uh, boxes dropped from 300 million to 68 million. At the same time, the cost of, uh, of the acres increased from uh, $700 to more than $2,000. And then most important, there is no cure for HRB disease. And uh, there are many groups uh, that are trying to figure out how to fight back these, uh, these uh, bacteria. And the way we are trying to, to fight these bacteria has some nice novelty. So we are trying with this multi-institutional multi collaboration to develop a synthetic bacteria with this particular feature. feature. So we want a cultural bacteria. CLAS right now is not culturable, and uh, these uh, uh, slow down the research on this uh, pathosystem. And uh, we want to create also a secretion system to deploy bacteriocin. So we can uh, use this bacteria, which is culturable, which has a system to secrete bactericin, and so we can use it as a cross protection against CLAS. But also, this system not only can work on CLAS, it can potentially be used for studying other pathosystems. And uh, 
So we have a different uh, theme task. And uh, for example, SGI, uh, funded by Craig Venter, and uh, in 2010, it was the, for the first time, was able to uh, generate a synthetic bacteria from scratch in laboratory. So they are taking care of um, the synthetic genome generation. And uh, here in Cornell, Michelle is working on the vector acquisition and transmission. And at USDA, in four peers, they are working and looking for bacteria in there can uh, uh, be used against CLAS. And uh, these are my tasks. So I'm trying to identify a factor gene that are helping the synthetic bacteria to help the infection. But also I'm looking for gene that can may induce pathogenic. So we want to, in, we want to include genes that allow infestation but we want to remove gene that can cause pathogenic. And uh, I'm also looking for a mechanical inoculation system. So they will be, give us a quick way to study the bacteria without using the vector right now. And uh, this is the name of this synthetic bacteria. And uh, we call uh, Librabacter defensorium. And hopefully, we can uh, use it to fight uh, CLAS. So first task, effector identification. So how CLAS manipulates its host. And um, so to do that, so CLAS is a flown-limited bacterium. And it takes advantage of uh, its vector, CLIDs. It's similar to aphid. It uses the stylet to probe the plant cells and uh, eventually uh, find the sieve elements. Here, an infected seed will uh, secrete also the bacteria. And these bacteria will uh, uh, secrete effector proteins. Now, these effector proteins can move in the phloem and possibly target different organelles and modulate plant function. So, this is the pipeline. Uh, we use to identify CLAS effectors. And it, this is similar to the one we use for uh, effector in, uh, in aphids. So we start with the Asiat CLAS coding genes, and, when, uh, and then we apply different uh, filters, like a presence of signal peptide, and we remove protein without, with the transmembrane domain. So we end up with 28 putative secreted effectors. And then we clone without the signal peptide, so we also overexpress only in the mature protein in Nicotiana bentamiana. And uh, we also look for um, localization of this effector in plant, and uh, we look also for phenotypes. And one of these protein, last 5315, it was really interesting. As you can see, two days later, the expression he had cell death. And uh, I will talk about this in the next few slides. And, um, but also, this uh, protein was targeting uh, chloroplast. We, we can see the, pro the signal surrounding the, the chloroplast. And uh, also, this protein was inducing callus deposition in the vascular tissue. And this is one of the symptoms we have in HLB disease plant. We have a high callus deposition in the vascular tissue. And uh, this is the, the protein. You can see there is a signal peptide. But we also have a chloroplast targeting sequence and then the rest of the protein. So the last 5315 is a protein without the signal peptide. And then I generate another construct without the signal peptide and a chloroplast targeting sequence. And while the 5315 was causing cell death, the one without the chloroplast targeting sequence was causing chlorosis. And uh, I found that the chlorosis was uh, caused by starch accumulation. So this protein triggers a massive starch accumulation in the leaf. And uh, you can see during the day, we have accumulation of the starch. And then more interestingly, we see that during the night, there is no degradation of the starch. And uh, we also look from the, some uh, gene expression of gene related to the starch synthesis and the starch degradation. And uh, this gene related to the starch degradation are downregulated. And uh, HLB symptoms are caused by mass, massive starch accumulation until chloroplast structures are disrupted with the resulting chlorosis. So this protein seems to be very important in the HLB pathosystem. And uh, there is also some follow-up of this protein. 
since we discovered these effectors candidates, other groups are working on these effectors. And they found first that this um, protein is highly secreted in plant infected and uh, can be used as a detection marker as this protein is moving away from the bacteria. So we can detect this uh, infection even if the bacteria is not present in the leaf but in other parts of the plant. And also they found that these proteins play a key role in the HLB patho pathogenicity. Now I was talking about cell death causing by these effectors and um, we found three effectors causing cell death. And uh, effector trigger immunity relies on a resistant protein that recognizes these effectors in a specific manner, <coughs> inducing program cell death to prevent the pathogen from spreading. And uh, one of the component for this response are the are resistant protein. So the idea is that nicotinamine tamiana as resistant protein, they can recognize these effectors while citrus doesn't have it. So we are uh, now in collaboration with the Michel, we want to try to see if we can uh, identify this R gene from nicotinamine tamiana. So we overexpress these effectors in nicotinamine tamiana fused to a flag tag. And then we can bind with magnetic beads this tag and possibly R gene interacting with the protein. And then we remove washing all the other host protein and then we can uh, synthesize, we can, uh, uh, sequence the R gene. And if we have an R gene from Nicotiana Bentamiana that recognizes the effector, we can uh, eventually generate a transgenic citrus expressing Nicotiana Bentamiana R gene that can uh, allow uh, the citrus plant to recognize it as and be immune to it. Now, uh, for this pathosystem, uh, the best management for this disease is the prevention of this in the introduction and establishment. And uh, so it's important to have a system for early detection. So you can remove uh, the infected plant and avoid uh, spreading on in, in your groves. And uh, these are really fascinating way to detect uh, CDAS infected citrus tree. And uh, in, uh, in uh, a USDA RS, King Gottwald, um, and his group, they are using dogs to recognize Silas infected tree. And uh, this dog can uh, detect the infection two weeks after inoculation. Usually with QPCR, it takes two to 12 months. Not because the QPCR is not uh, uh, reliable, but because the sampling of the tree is difficult. If you think the Silas can feed on the top of the tree, and then you take leaves, random leaves, you can have a negative um, tissue. So these are a really nice uh, way to detect silas in, uh, in, in the groves. Now, these dogs recognize plant early volatiles triggered by silas uh, bacterium, right? Now we know the silas bacterium secretes effector molecules after injection, after infection. And we can detect this uh, gene, uh, effector gene after six hours after inoculation. And this effector, we know that they can travel through the vascular system and modulate host activity. So my idea was, um, are these dogs detecting volatiles triggered by effector molecules? So, and, uh, so I designed this experiment. Uh, we have four buckets, uh, contain 16 Nicotiana bentamiana plants and a wild type and then control and 16 silas effectors. These are the effectors that are early expressed during infection. And uh, the dogs, when they identify a silas infected citrus, they sit down. They never work with the, with the nicotiana mentamiana. And uh, I'm the only one that knows that this bucket contains the silas effectors. And so we run the dogs. We use uh, eight dogs and uh, these are dogs first bucket, second bucket, and this is the bucket with effectors. And uh, it was a really amazing when uh, it was uh, recognizing and uh, sit there. So they recognizing this plant and they think it is infected. So they are recognizing the same volatiles we have in citrus and the same volatiles is triggered by one effector in Nicotiana bentamiana. 
So these are other dogs, and uh, all dogs recognize this bucket. And uh, these are a bucket with 16 plants. So the dog were quickly recognized this effect. So we also line up these plants. So every plant was expressing one effect. And at the end, they recognize four effectors. And so, so these dogs are recognizing C last infected citrus at the early stage using effectors marker. These are indirect recognition. They use a volatiles. So our idea is now to develop um, an antibody protein uh, detection kit against these effector molecules that are early expressed and that are detected by the dogs. So hopefully this can kit we can be using the groves and the and they can detect early the sea the, the last in, in citrus leaf. Now, the second task was uh, mechanical inoculation. And uh, there is no mechanical inoculation for sea last so far. So we developed a new way to inoculate sea last in plant. And uh, again, sea last is not culturable yet. So we use silic um, sea last infected gut for, uh, for, uh, for the bacteria. And then we use this system. is a 3D printer device that can be attached to the plant and communicated with the vascular tissue. So I extract the, the gut, I extract the bacteria from the gut, and then I add the bacteria in this system. And then I, will, I wait 24 hours, and then I uh, use QPCR to detect bacteria in, in the plants. And uh, <clears throat> 24 hours, I was able to detect C last in all the tissue. And uh, two months later, also, I could detect C last bacteria into the leaf. So this is a systemic uh, infection. And uh, to show you how it works, I now using a fluorescent probe. So again, I'm using this fluorescent probe, I add this molecule in the device, I wait 24 hours, and then I slice the stem and the roots. And then I look under a fluorescent microscope. And uh, you want to see that, right? OK, these are the results. So these are the different sections. You can see the fluorescent probe is uh, evenly distributed in the vascular tissue, both the stem, but also in, in the roots. And uh, so this system can deliver bacteria, but can also deliver molecules. So why we stop there? So we can uh, use to screen molecule against pathogens. We can also screen molecule against insect. But we can also use this device to deliver double RNA to regulate host genes. Or we can deliver double RNA for plant feeding, and then uh, this, this system will deliver the molecule where the insect was, is feeding. So this was the second task. And uh, this is uh, my last project. And um, in uh, this project, I'm studying uh, interaction between fungus and uh, insects. And uh, to do that, I'm using entopathogenic fungi. And we want to use this uh, system to, to manage citrus, um, to manage uh, diaphorina citrus. They see it, they transmit the bacteria. Because right now, the main control for the HRB is to control the vector. So we want to reduce the number of the vector. And to do that, they use a chemical insecticide. But this is not a sustainable strategy. First, we have environmental pollution. We reduce, there is a reduction of three trophic interaction. And insect can, uh, can become resi resistant to insects. And uh, we may have pesticide residue in uh, food. And obviously, we need constant application to maintain the effectiveness. So we are trying now this uh, fungus, Isaria fumorosea. And these are results after six days post inoculation. And uh, the way we do is uh, spraying the spore to the silids, and then we look the percent of mortality over six days. And uh, you can see after six days, we have uh, already almost 100% of mortality. But already after three days, you can see disease symptoms on our uh, silids. 
and in four days, we have uh, the fungus breaking through the exoskeleton, and uh, six days later, the fungus is, is ready to spread again and infect horizontally or vertically. So these uh, entomal pathogenic fungi are well known, but the mechanism underlying the molecular pathogenesis of entomal pathogenic fungi are rather limited understood. Especially the vector machinery has not been established in the interaction between fungus and insects. So here again, we are trying to identify potential effector candidates. And uh, we start with the coding, protein counts, and we apply our uh, filters, and then we end up with 170 candidate effectors. And uh, we are also combining these effectors with RNA sequences analysis and gene expression. And um, we found that many genes, many candidate effectors are early, early, highly expressed during the first um, hours, uh, also after 24 hours and after 72 hours, and then it, it goes down. And uh, this is um, a very beginning of this uh, project. But we also want to later to do some protein functional analysis. And uh, we can uh, try to express this protein in plants or use an artificial diet and check insect fecundity and performance to see what, what molecule are, can interfere with the, with the insect. And the, this was a, my last slide. So final remarks. <coughs> So most pathogens are defeated following detection of conserved pathogen molecules. And uh, pathogens deliver molecules called effector inside their host to enable infestation. And effector molecules are key component for all pathosystems. And uh, effector molecules can be used as a guide to improve resistance in plants. And uh, so I would like to thank these people that really helped me to build my uh, strength in my uh, career and helped me to, to build my research program. So thank you. Any questions? The microphone isn't working. I don't, oh, it does. I'm just curious in terms of the work and the research you've been doing, if the result of this is going to be, of this work is going to be more applicable in terms of detecting the pathogen in the, in the citrus tree, or is it going to be more used uh, in terms of actual control procedures? Uh, the PECTOS program? Yes. Uh, well, um, <clears throat> both. We want to use a uh, uh, factors. First, we want to identify the factor function. What they do, we don't know yet the function of these factors. What they target. So when we know the target, we may know the function. We know what the importance of this uh, molecule in the interaction in this pathosystem. And then we can use these as a tool to improve the citrus resistance. We can, uh, but now we can, uh, for example, we can use, um, if we can, resistant genes to improve it. And the other way is to find the target of these effectors. Maybe they are susceptible uh, molecule. So when we did really identify the function, we may find a way to, to, to improve the resistance. Anyone else? All right, so I have a dog question. So the dogs are detecting the volatile made by the plant, right? right. And you're going to be working on making antibodies to the effector. Right. Are you also working on collecting headspace and seeing, identifying what these volatiles could be? So this uh, is something that we will do it. We are, this is um, something really recent. So the idea is actually to see what volatiles are expressed uh, triggering uh, Nicotiramine Tamiana with effector, non-effector, and also in situs infected, non-infected, and see if, if there is an overlapping. So we will also look for uh, volatiles. Hi, uh, I was really intrigued by the 3D printed device right. that you attached. And I was curious if you know 
if the Silas is actually alive? So we think he's alive because uh, two months later I can uh, uh, detect gene expression. So we are looking at uh, um, DNA and RNA. And we look at the expression of the effectors, 28 effectors, and they are upregulated. So it looks like the bacteria is alive. Uh, my question actually follows straight on from that. Um, uh, it's a question about your sea lice effectors um, expressed in the plant. Is the population size, if you then infect the plant with sea lice, is the population size of the sea lice uh, increased or decreased? And does it affect the transmissibility back to the insect? So with it's the, asking about the effect of proteins, not from the perspective of their immediate function, but in terms of the effect on the sea lass and whether the sea lass benefits from the secretion of those proteins. Uh, can you repeat, please, the question? Of course. Um, so you have plants that are expressing sea lass effector proteins. Right. If, have you done the experiments to then um, infect those plants ah. with sea lass and see if they have a selective no, benefit? No, we did not. Thank but you. we were using uh, Nicotina Bentamiana and uh, it's difficult to infect Nicotinamine Tamiana. But right now we are expressed, we are generating transgenic citrus expressing this uh, factor. So in that case, we can try to inoculate Silas in this transgenic plant and see if it increase or decrease the, the growth of the bacteria. Yeah, we have Brian over here. So my question, my question follows on from the dog question. If you, uh, if you make either a diagnostic or some kind of treatment that's targeted essentially at one of the effectors, why don't, don't you expect the CLAS to just drop that effector? Is there any reason to think that it's essential for infection? We, we think, why we think is important? Sorry, say again. Evolutionarily, why doesn't the CLAS just dump that effector so that your diagnostic no longer works, that your intervention no longer works? Why should they dump the effector? Uh, because it, I, I mean, it, so if the effector is uh, it, if the effector is what you're using to uh, to recognize plants that then need to be called, say, that's a strong selective pressure against the pathogen, and there would be a strong selective advantage for a pathogen that dropped that effector so that you could no longer detect the infection. Right, but well, we are using a cocktail of uh, antibodies, so it needs to drop many effectors. So in the case, I don't know if it can maybe not survive anymore if you, can, you keep drop all the all the factors. That's well, essentially the question is, how much do you know about the essentialness for infection of these effectors? Uh, we don't know yet. The function, we don't know the function yet. We know that some of the effectors are early expressed. Six hours later, we can detect these effectors. 24 hours later, we have a different waves of effectors. A week later, we have a different waves of effectors. But we still don't know the function of that. We can uh, hypothesize that the early effectors are important for uh, Modify, modulate, define defense responses. Then later effector are probably important for spreading the bacteria. So, so the, the psyllid, the psyllid is uh, delivering CLAS into the phloem, right. correct? Is it possible that your device is introducing CLAS into the xylem as well? And it's, and it's, it's possible, yeah. I mean, we think. Uh, is actually possible because um, we see on the top of the plant, on the bottom of the roots. So the only way to go up is actually the xylem taking up, taking the the bacteria and moving up, and possibly the bacteria can move from the xylem to the phloem because a day later we can see the bacteria in the leaves. Okay. There are studies that show that these bacteria sometimes you can uh, find in the xylem. And they remove the phloem, and they, the bacteria can still move from one part of the plant to another part of the plant. So it's possible. But it is getting into the phloem with your device. That maybe xylem also, but but you're sure. I, they, I think it starts with the xylem, and then it moves back to the phloem. Right. But we don't know yet because we don't have a um, picture. We need to make picture and section and see where actually yeah. is present the bacteria. 
So is there any evidence that some of these effectors, these plant effectors, are also expressed in the insect and then injected through the saliva and not really made by the bacteria inside the plant? So that first wave that you get six hours, I assume that you're delivering by insect. <laughs> No, we um, use a grafting inoculation. Oh, okay. We use so, a grafting inoculation or ACP inoculation. I mean, that would be because there is evidence, or I guess it's controversial, is CLAS actually replicating when, inside the insect? Right. And the idea is also that the insect, while it's puncturing the cell, is actually injecting potentially a factor from the bacteria. Yeah. So yeah. there is already, yeah. But the effectors are produced by bacteria. The ones that yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, are there any questions in Geneva? Okay, so please join me in thanking Marco once again for an excellent seminar. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.